Okay, so the last presentation for the management section is um, by Ernesto, and he's going to be talking about uh, ensemble modeling. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Um, so I'm going to be talking about these uh, projects that, um, well, it's not really projects, a bunch of initiatives that have been working on model ensembles and um, mostly reporting where we are now um, on this, uh, with this group. This group was, um, um, so this group uh, came together based on uh, uh, ICS workshop on uh, recruitment forecast. <laughs> the image, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, and some and a project that in the JRC we found a couple well some money to bring people together and talk about this. So the the authors of the of the of the presentation were for the first workshop that was held in Lisbon, and the picture is for the second workshop which was in Seattle. And uh, actually, it's, Kelly is not on the picture because she she was not that day in, but she's a huge part of this process. And uh, I didn't have the picture from Lisbon, so that's why we have names and pictures mixed together. Um, so we all, we, all, we all experience this, which is you have a, a great model. You, have, you did a lot of work on that model. That model is working perfectly, except the next year when you sit back again, you have another year of data, you have some new processes maybe or whatever, and your model collapse. Um, and uh, a large part of, of the idea behind this thing is if we actually uh, um, are on, sitting on a room and we are doing the stock assessments on a working group, what can we do? What do we do at that situation? And um, that's uh, part of the, well, the presentation is focused or the work of this group is focused on that part, on operationalizing the model ensembles to be used on a stock assessment context. So I'm not going to talk about model ensembles as a tool that you can use for everything because there's lots of things you can do with model ensembles. Uh, the focus here is I'm sitting on a room, I'm doing stock assessments, and I want to use this tool because something. We'll try to explain that. So, well, it broke down. So what do you do now? And uh, um, what uh, uh, this group uh, came forward with or trying to build on is well, one of the tools you can use in a situation like that is actually model ensembles. You can think about that collapse of that model um, based on the fact that it's a single model. It may not be representing all the structures that your system or the system you're trying to model actually has. And by, by choosing a single model, you end up putting yourself on a situation of risk, which is you're not, you may not be covering you're not being robust regarding the structure uncertainty that may exist on your, on your modeling procedure, okay? So what we thought was, well, one thing you can do actually is you can expand uh, uh, that, that model. You can try to build more models or bring in more models that maybe they represent other parts of that uncertainty, other, other structures, and put them together. So what is an ensemble model? Um, in, a, in a very simplistic way, and I'm not even sure I understand all the, the, the quirks that you can have on ensemble modeling, and when you start talking with the machine learning uh, uh, community, things get complicated very quick. But uh, you can think about it as, as a, a way of putting together several quantities of interests that each one of these models produce. So think about SSB or recruitment or F or something like that. There's a quantity of interest that your model generates that you're interested in. And now what you have is you have several models generating, all of them generating those quantities of interest you're, 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 you want to deal with. And ensemble models are a technique that allows you to bring those things together and compute uh, your ensemble prediction and the variance for that uh, prediction and et cetera. So, um, What's the utility of these ensemble models? We, we, we see that in, in mainly um, two things. One is integrating structural uncertainty. So that's the obvious one. And, and it seems obvious, at least from, from a marine biology, fishery science perspective. That's the, 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 the simple, that's the, the obvious one because what we are trying to model is extremely complicated and it's, it's not easy to find, or in my opinion, it's impossible to find one model that will 
take and be able to, to, to model and to estimate and to parameterize all the processes. So that's the obvious one. Now, the, the, the community dealing with weather forecasting, they use it on a different situation, which is they start, they, they basically uh, uh, change the initial conditions of their projections and they use ensemble models to bring those uh, uh, projections. In the end, you end up with def, uh, a set of different projections based on the initial conditions. And they use the ensemble models to bring that together into a single estimate. So that's the, the second uh, um, major utility of, of uh, ensembles besides the structural uncertainty. Um, because we are thinking on this idea of working groups, one thing we, we, we discussed, and uh, uh, we are still working on this, is that uh, a lot of times you end up doing sensitivity analysis, which if you think about the sensitivity analysis, it's not so different from having different initial conditions for your projections. So maybe on a when you're doing a sensitivity analysis, ensemble models can help you instead of choosing one, again, integrating across all that uh, uh, uncertainty. Coming back to that idea of the working group and the assessment uh, uh, work or assessment objectives, we are focusing on these three uh, uh, things. We want to estimate stock status. We want to, est to, to estimate future fishing opportunities. And this is the European lingo for the TAC that you can get next year. Okay. And building operating models. So these are the three things we are interested in. Stock status, future fishing opportunities, building operating models. Now, when we think about uh, ensembles, and if we, if we look at it as if you are uh, dealing with a, with a weighted average, let's say, one of the things that you need to start talking about is which metric do you use to actually weight each of these models? And this is a, it's a major issue, of course, with ensemble models. Um, there's, there's lots of people working on this. Um, what we, we picked up these three uh, uh, options. Uh, there's a, there's a, a a bunch of guys saying, well, we could do this using Bayesian statistics. And, and one of the most obvious one is to, uh, is to use bias factors to weight your models. Um, information theory, so this is using the archaic and, and other derivatives to weight your models. And then this idea of using a tactical weighting. Tactical weighting, it's more, uh, it's more like what do you want to do with your model? If you're in interested in prediction, for example, if what we want is forecast the next two years to set your catch opportunities, then maybe what, you, what the, the, the weighting metric that you want to use is something related to the capacity of each of these models to do that forecast, to do predictions. So that's the kind of tactical, that's what's behind this idea of tactical weights, where what you want is you want to use something that is related to what you want to do with the models to use as a weight for, uh, uh, for those model ensembles. Um, one, one interesting feature that, that we, we discussed at some point is this idea that we, in, in ecology or in fisheries in this case, one thing that you, we may want to look at is time varying weights. So, and, and think about regime shifts and things like that. You may need to adapt your weights to different periods of your, of your uh, system and not necessarily have one single uh, not, not that you change the weighting uh, system, but that you change the weighting metric, that you recompute that metric if you think that there's a shift that actually justifies, change the, 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 the weighting that you're using at some point. We're actually not working on this right now, but it's something we have on the back of our heads. Now, um, one, one of the usual uh, criticisms, and, and, and quite rightly so, is that um, where, the way you build your, model, your ensemble, so the models that you put on your ensemble, they may bias the results of your ensemble. So say that you have, uh, your, your, you, you have two situations in your, in your system, you have a bunch of models that model mo better one than the other, and what you do is you, you use uh, 1,000 models of one of, for one of the situations and two for the other one. So if you simply average across that, uh, uh, those models, what you're doing is you're overweighting that situation for which you have more models. So we have been thinking about this as uh, uh, the model space. Why, how do you actually can build an ensemble where your model space, the, the components, the elements of that ensemble 
actually are covering all the possibilities that you may have for that particular system. Mm -hmm. um, easier said than done, obviously. It's not really something that is easy to do. The, the, the usual, um, well, one, one, of the, one of the suggestions we had at some point was some, someone saying, well, just build a Uber model and then start testing which branches of that model you can remove. Yeah, yes, sure. I don't think it's going to work on a, on a stock assessment uh, context, but yeah. The, but that's the point in the end. Um, if you think that what you want, if, you, if your basis is, there are several states of nature that I want to model, that I want to bring in, and that I want to integrate across. And then I have to have uh, uh, my model ensemble, my model space has to cover those states of nature. Then we need to find a way of actually uh, designing that model space so we don't end up biasing one of the situations just because we have more models for that situation. The solutions uh, we are talking about now at this point that they seem to be uh, uh, useful is uh, one, one, of the, one of the options is to have a kind of a clustering process. So basically you run whatever, whichever models you want and then we use some kind of clustering process to actually build or allocate these many models to different situations to those different states of nature. So we are assuming that by clustering, we can actually identify those big uh, uh, boxes that represent different states of nature. So that would be one of the options. And then you would do your waiting on like a two-stage process where you kind of wait within the, 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 the cluster and then across clusters. Um, so that meeting in Seattle, there's the, the um, Sean Anderson did a lot of work on that with Colin Miller. Um, that work is not yet ready to be reported. I mean, there's a, there's a web page you can look at, but for now it's not yet to, to, okay to be reported. The other idea is this guy, Dropper, in 95. Um, he, he, on, on his paper, he says, well, forget about actually being able to, do, to, to find that model space. It's impossible. We're not going to do it. So what we want to do it is something that is not optimal, but it's useful and can, can, can work. And he came up with this idea of model expansion. And the idea of model expansion is you start from one, two or three models that you think they are uh, uh, good models. They are the models you need for your process. And then what you do is from there, you start building the other uh, models that will expand your model space into something that at some point you're comfortable with. Um, in, in the context of, of stock assessment, you can think of a process like this being done, for example, on a benchmark, where someone uh, or the people that are uh, dealing with, with, uh, with the assessment for one stock or for several stocks actually spend some time designing that model space, expanding the initial model so they feel comfortable that the models that they have cover the, the, the model space. So these are the two, uh, the two options that are on the table right now. How do we operationalize this? And uh, um, I'm bringing this in also because of where we are and the things that we are talking about in this conference. Um, the idea here was there's a bunch of things that you cannot actually do. There's a bunch of things that you cannot actually do on a single environment. So you have different models. Models have their own way of computing different things and processes and bringing in variants and whatever. And, and so within the environment of the model, you need to be able to compute the things that then can be used to compare models. And that is, and that is for example, predictions, uh, the, the, the statistics the, uh, that you need, uh, uh, tactical scores, for example, when we are, when the, the example I gave about prediction, you want to compute those scores within the environment of the model. You don't want to compute the score or not the score, the statistic that will be used for the score, because the score has to be done across the models, but you want to compute that within the environment of the model. Then what, what we were looking at was uh, to have a common environment. In this case, we used FLR because, uh, well, mainly we were in the room, so there was no, there was no way out of it. But uh, in fact, uh, uh, what matters is that um, from the moment that you have computed those statistics, those feeds, you've done the predictions, you came up with all, that, uh, uh, all, that, all, all those statistics that are the basis for the ensemble, there's no reason for not doing that ensembling process in a single environment where you can actually bring together the different models wherever 
they, the, the, the base environment for that model was. So this was the, the, the idea of um, kind of, we, we ended up with mixed results. I mean, we almost got there, but then we didn't really do it. Uh, but it's, um, and, and Kelly yesterday talked about these groups that are dealing about uh, trying to bring things together from different models. The methods working group, for example, is also doing something similar to that. Um, I don't think we are really far from it. Uh, I think the problem is, is a typical problem on fishery science is that people get together a week to do the work and then they go away and they come back next year for another week. And I think most of the problem is actually that there's not really an effort directly to let's do this thing, let's make it work. I don't think technically there's any reason for not having a single environment that can bring together different models. So the example I have here is uh, uh, Iberian Ake. Um, um, what we did with, with um, well, what we did for all the stocks actually that we had in, on, on the table during that meeting, which were, I don't know, maybe five or six different stocks. What we did was we designed, we tried to design that, that, uh, that uh, model space with, with an A4A stock assessment. And, and these are the differences. So there's things like uh, uh, time varying selectivity or, or indices uh, with the smoothers or without smoothers or whatever. So there's a combination of those things. Then there's, in this case, there's two different stock recruitment relationships. And all of these uh, uh, were applied to two different M's. So one was a Gislason model and the other one was a constant 0 0.4, I think was the number uh, model. So in the end, what we have is 36 different models. That's what, we, that's what we ended up with. We applied these 36 different models. These are the results of those 36 fits. Um, Apart from the, 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 the color palette, which is brilliant, of course, uh, you, can, it's, it's, you, can, you can see this kind of thing here. And I'm calling your attention to this because this will creep in later on when we look at the results. Okay? So these are, the, our, these are our basis for the ensemble. So this is the feeds that we now we are going to use to um, uh, ensemble together those statistics. And here are the metrics we were looking at. Um, so what you have here is the value of the metric. Uh, if you sum these together, they will sum one, I hope. Uh, each of these bars is a different model, so there should be 36 bars in each one of these. And these are the metric that was used for each of those, uh, uh, well, these four metrics. So the easiest one, the easy ones first, the archaic, the BIC. Now this is something we call an int cast, but it's not really an int cast. It's more like a prediction of missing values. So basically, the recent values on the catch matrix were removed and the model was refitted and those, uh, and those values were predicted by the model. It's not really an int cast. And anyway, the, 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 the metric then is computed as a, as a mean square error between what is your prediction and what you removed from that catch matrix. Um, this one is a, a cohort generalized cross-validation, um, which is, um, it's one of those things that it's a great idea, but then it doesn't really work as, as well as you would like. So basically what we are trying here is a cross-validation, but because of the problems of the correlation across uh, uh, your population, what we did was we were, uh, our cross-validation was done for full cohorts at the time. So basically you remove one cohort, refit the model, and compute the mean square error between the cohort you removed and the prediction you have. So the idea was to try to overcome the problem of assuming when you're doing a cross-validation, when these one leave one out uh, processes, that you're assuming that things are independent when they aren't. So this was this, this court uh, generalized cross-validation. So anyway, what uh, this would be, so this would be like tactical uh, uh, weights, right? This is the, the information-based weight. The reason we use the BIC here, and I'm not, I have, to, I have to, to say that I looked at these results for the first time this week, so I'm not sure everything is exactly as I'm saying. But the idea with the BIC is that there's a bunch of authors saying that if you use the ratios between BICs, it's like an approximation to bias factors. And, and so what we tried, the reason we used the BIC here was because we wanted to have that component into our weights. Um, I'm not sure it's well done. I'm not sure it's really how it works, but in any case, it gave us a, a kind of, one different uh, option from the other ones we had. So what, what we see here, which is, uh, uh, we've seen it everywhere we, when we use the archaic, is that the archaic tends to select one model. 
And that's fine because that's what it was designed for. It was to select one model. It was not to, to, to weight several models. But this is something in the ensemble procedure creates some problems because in fact, you end up not weighting across several models. What you end up doing is, you know, picking up the results from one model and maybe contaminated a, a little bit with another model. But that's, that's, anyway, that's how the archive works in this context. Um, the BIC in this case seems to be quite flat. So there's just one model here that was uh, uh, downweighted. Then these statical metrics, they seem to be more responsive to the differences across the models, okay? Um, results, stock status. So we have uh, bio, biomass over BMSY in one side, and this is F over FMSY. I'm sorry, but the, the logo for my institution covered the label. <laughs> uh, but uh, well, that's what it is. And these are, these are the, so these are the 36 models and, the, and for each model, I think we simulated 500 iterations maybe. Uh, so these are all those things put together in a single plot, okay? And these here are the estimates using those model ensembles with the different metrics. So they are not terribly different. They are all more or less on the same region, which is kind of okay. This one here is the archaic, and it's interesting because the archaic selects one model, so it's in the middle of, of this mess. And the other ones, they are a bit off this, and this is a bit worried, worrying for me, because what's happening at this point, not really here, but it, what seems to be happening, is that your ensemble estimate is actually outside the data, the, the estimates of each of, of the models. And if you think about a shape like this, I mean, this is a banana shape, of course, the average is going to be somewhere here, you know. So, uh, what do you do then? So, there's, there's a bunch of, of, there's something that people need to think about at, at some point when we are doing these things, which is, and I, I refer back to the model space, but I'm not sure that's really the answer. The fact is that when you have a bivariate uh, 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 um, variable, then you may end up on situations like this. So, this is model, um, stock status. Now, fishing opportunities. For each of the models, the, we forecasted what's going to be the catch in two years. Uh, what's going to be, I'm just seeing if the five is open, not yet. <laughs> um, what's going to be the catch in two years if you fish at F status school? So that if, you, if you keep fishing as you are now, what's the catch in, in the next two years with uncertainty? And this is what we get for the 36 models. Then we ensemble this. And the scales are the same. So one thing that model ensembles give you for free is if things are okay, if, you're not, if there's not bias, and if there's not a very strong correlation across the models, you actually decrease the variance by simply put, pulling together more data. So what happens here is that those weights, those weighting metrics, they actually gave you, uh, or gave us in this case, uh, a prediction for, or, or a TAC, with, which is a lot more precise than each one of the models individually, okay? Except the archaic, for the obvious reason, because it's actually not averaging across a lot of models, just picking one, okay? So, in this case, this seems to be a big advantage that we can take from this process. If your, your predictions, in this case, if your variable is not completely biased and you don't have, you know, one estimate here and the other one on the other side, because in that case, you need to be careful with what you do. Then operating models. Um, so what we do here is we, we build uh, those weights and we use those weights to sample from each of those 36 runs based on those weights. And then we put it together and we have our operating model. That's how we did it. So this first one is equal weights. And uh, what you see again, the, the main, or the most interesting thing here is again the archaic, because the archaic, again, because it selects one model, it ends up not really mixing those models. While the other ones, and this first one is, this first one is equal weights. This is the archaic. Here is the BIC. The int cast. And the cohort uh, uh, cross validation. Now, um, all of them are, are pulling from the different models. So you end up with slightly different variances on these things. But the, the real problem here 
is that these operating models at this point, they are, they, they are bimodal. And this is, if you remember well, this is this. It's just bringing that bimodality into your operating model. So what does that mean? Well, um, because I'm an optimist, I think, well, like, we did the models quite strong. Between an M of 0 0.2 and a Gislason, there's a huge range of models that you can have. And this is, a, a, for me, it's a good example. It's a good example that um, we, we really uh, uh, need to think about that model space when we are trying to do these ensembles. Actually, that, that's why I was asking uh, Alan the other day, yeah, you're, you're, you, when you're doing that ensemble for the, the, the Hollywood, you're actually, all of them are more or less on the same region, so you don't really have a problem with these kind of things. You may, if you have, if you're trying to expand your model base, then you, you need to think about this. Super ensembles, yeah. I mean, Lise Brooks came the other day and said, oh, we should use a Uber super duper ensemble because we should ensemble and then model the ensembles and then remodel and then, uh, and that's, that, there's a bit of that. Where do you stop? But one thing that the super ensembles bring in, and we are not working with that yet, uh, uh, for those, well, let's start. The super ensemble basically it's the model of the model. So instead of just weighting these models, you actually run, you feed the model to, their, to those uh, results. And so you have, what it brings in is you have a lot more opportunities to bring covariates, for example, to use different uh, distributions, you know, you're, you're modeling. So you can do whatever you want to, uh, uh, when, when you bring in the super ensembles. Uh, Shan was doing like training the model on, on the, the on the, the Myers database and then refitting the model. You know, you have a lot of things uh, that, you, that, you, that are available for you now. Now, because I'm a, bit, uh, uh, um, I'm a bit obsessed on bringing economists to do stock assessment, this is one of the areas where actually it wouldn't be, you, you, you could easily bring as a covariate for these models, things related to price or, or, or um, fuel price or, or you know, um, the number who won the World Cup, you know, things like that that may explain part of the fishing patterns. So super ensembles could be a tool for that, also for environmental covariates, for example. Um, if you, see, if, I guess all people in the room have been at some point related to a stock assessment. A lot of the work that we are talking about here, we are doing it already. You know, when you're doing a stock assessment on a working group, you fit hundreds of models, you do, you test things, you change here, you change there, you do God knows what you try to do to fit that model. So we are already doing part of this work. The fact is that at the end of the day, we do this decision that, that in my opinion, I don't know why we do that decision, which is we give probability of one to one model and zero to everything else. But in fact, a large part of the work we are talking about here it, we are doing it in the, in the stock assessment working groups. And some of these guys, some of these statisticians working with uh, late 90s, so it's, it was more about uh, model averaging, they were calling it at that point. They were saying by not bringing that uncertainty into your predictions, you're actually not reporting the uncertainty of your predictions well. You're ignoring part of the process, which is the selection process, the model selection process. And by ignoring that, your predictions are already not reporting properly uncertainty. So that's my last slide. Um, we can integrate across uh, uh, um, model structure. We can uh, um, deal with uh, um, things like sensitivity analysis, um, initial, or this is more the climate people, but the initial conditions. And definitely these three metrics, uh, stock status, uh, 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 future uh, fishing opportunities and operating models. These are three very useful products that we need and where model ensembles seem to be uh, um, able to help us. But we are, I don't see, there's still a bunch of things we need to think about it. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Okay, we've got time for one question. Thank you for your talk. Um, I think the example that you presented was uh, for a case where your, your data didn't change, your likelihoods weren't changing between your different models. Um, do you have 
any thoughts on how you might weight models in an ensemble where your data changes between models or the likelihood structure that you use for yeah. di different data components changes between models? Yeah, so um, the idea is, especially if you use these tactical things, which are not related to the likelihood, but they are related to what to the skill of the model that that's what the the the, the um, part of the community dealing with with these things call it the skill of the model if you have something like that there's nothing stopping you from actually mixing models like i don't know ss3 or sam or whatever if in the end of the day the metric is the same and it's on the same uh, same quantity of course not in different units if you are if you are dealing with a metric that is the same and if you use things like they represent the skill of the model and they are not related with the, the likelihood to, and, and you know all the details that you have there there shouldn't be a problem of course easier said than done we didn't test that okay thanks a lot mister thank you